My daughter, Julia, is a student at McAllister. I myself went to Grinnell College down south, so uh, just saying, but um, all part of the same ilk of schools. Anyway, it's um, great to be able to talk to you today. Uh, I'm a director of content and communications at Salesforce and uh, have worked in Microsoft and tech for a long time. And I'm also a writer outside of that and work with books and magazines and museums and things. So communications is a center of my career and this is a new type of communication. So intrigued in how we all work. And as you might know, Salesforce is one of the tech companies who's basically said, hey everyone, you can work remotely for at least a calendar year, if not indefinitely. So I think we're all pondering exactly what that means. So a uh, timely topic. All right, thank you. Anna, you're showing up next for me. So if you could give a little intro. Sure, thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Anna Graziano. I graduated from McAllister in 2013. Um, and I am currently working for a company called Privia Health in Washington, D.C., but I work remotely from my home office. Um, I'm the Associate Director of Innovation there, so working on building kind of new solutions to problems that healthcare providers are facing, so very topical for what's going on today. Um, I've actually been working remotely for, I think, about three years. Um, I was living in the D.C. area, but I'm from Minnesota originally, obviously went to McAllister, wanted to come back here, so kind of fell into this. And I would say for me, working remotely is definitely not something I saw myself doing. I wouldn't say that I um, would have picked it had I had a choice, um, but I'm you know, really social, I really like to be around people, um, but I have found that it actually is a really good way for me to stay productive, and I do get to kind of get the camaraderie out of my colleagues that I was looking for. So looking forward to talking about it today. Thank you. Sophie? Yeah, hi, I'm Sophie. Um, I use she, her. I graduated in 2014 uh, with an international studies major. Um, and I've kind of had a, a winding path of like many different sort of career trajectories. Um, but right now I am trained to become a financial advisor. Um, I work at Morgan Stanley. Um, and I would say that working remotely so far has been a mixed bag. Yeah, so we've been remote since uh, the middle of March and we were just told that we are unlikely to be back in the office until at least the end of this year, if not longer. Thank you, it sounds like a common theme that's showing up. Um, and then last but not least, Ben. Hi everybody, so, um, I'm class of 1999, anthropology major, psychology minor, and I've had a very meandering path in my career, I'll, I'll admit. You know, I started out, like I left Peace Corps, I left um, McAllister and went to Peace Corps for two years. And then I, I, I did the do-gooder thing for many years, and then I decided um, to get my MBA, and I started working in, um, you know, the private sector. And in general, it's been a, an amazing experience, and, and I'd say over the past three years, I've worked remotely. Um, in very senior roles as a COO for a, a startup. And now I work for a global law firm, but I'm not a lawyer. I, I run operations for the firm. So um, I have a lot of um, appreciation for being able to work remotely. It's something, you know, similar to what Anna said. I wouldn't have necessarily thought at first that I'd pick to do this, but when I had the opportunity to do it, it's actually something very special for me because I have, a, I have young kids. I like to be close to them. And so being able to, you know, wake up in the morning and have breakfast with them and be able to check in on them throughout the day, especially right now when they're not in school, is actually a real treat for me. Um, and being able to be closer to everybody is, is really nice because we spend a lot of time um, commuting, you know, like even in New York City, when I, I lived there for many, many years, you know, I, I'd spend 45 minutes to an hour commuting, you know, eight miles, you know, to get, to get into the office. So being able to be home and get that time back and actually spend it on things that I value. Um, like sometimes it, it needs to be work, but in many times it allows me to just be able to, you know, help my son with his karate class, you know, on zoom or being able to just spend time outside throwing a Frisbee, you know? So um, there's a lot of benefits to doing it. And there are very many strategies that you can employ to make sure that you have those connections um, with your colleagues and that you can have that 
substantive experience. It's not the same as working in an office, but it is actually something that you can do. It just takes different skills and different types of techniques to get there. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna ask the first question and please just feel free panelists to unmute yourselves and jump in um, if you have an answer. So I would love to know, some of you mentioned a home office, what tips do you have for kind of setting up a really productive workspace um, in your home or even if it's not your home in the place that you're currently living? I can jump in to start it off if you guys want to. <laughs> so I cannot stress this enough, you need to have a separate space for your work. Um, sitting on the couch on your laptop, bad idea <laughs> okay straight up you know like not only is it ergonomically horrible and you will find that you are really really tired you'll get back aches and neck aches and wrist cramps and stuff like that but it's also like you will find that if you give dedicated space to it um that the, uh, the rest of your spaces don't become workspaces and don't feel like workspaces and especially when you are in, like in, in working on a deadline or have something high pressure that you're working on the last thing you want to do is like associate your bed with a workspace and then it makes it harder for you to go to sleep at night, right? So I can't stress enough to, to have a good, you know, space that's separate from, from things, if possible, even se like a separate room. I know that many folks, if you're graduating from college, you're probably going back home. There might be a spare bedroom in, in your um, family's house. And, and I'd recommend doing that and not doing it within your own room, you know, to the extent that you can. I and mean, not everybody's gonna have that luxury, but um, it's, it's important. And I'd also say that, Having the right equipment is also really important. Making sure that, you know, if you need an external monitor, if you need ergonomic keyboards or, or mice or something like that, those are really important things to make sure you have because, you know, we, we, they are neglected in many cases and there's a lot of research now showing that it really makes your, your work life important. Um, the other thing that you can consider is shifting spaces during the day to allow for some change in the day, especially when you're working all day long. I'll tell you like, so in my background, you can say I, like I'm in one room, I start my day in a different room um, of the house and I, and I finish my day where I am right now. And that actually helps me kind of just kind of pass the day and have something different and just kind of just a change of scenery sometimes is nice. I have that luxury that I can have two different spaces to do that in, um, but not everybody does. But if you can do that, um, it's, it's good. Um, I can share a little bit more. I think I agree with the dedicated space. Um, I think the psychology behind that is really important. So maybe it's even just, I only sit in this chair to do work and I sit in this chair when I'm eating dinner, at, you know, at the table or something, if you're limited in space. Um, the other thing I would say that kind of goes with that theme is make sure you get up, brush your teeth, uh, you know, put on pants. <laughs> that kind of thing every day because that will make you feel like you're getting ready and get you in the mindset um, to to talk. And I, the nature of my work, I sometimes have to get up really early for meetings. Um, sometimes my first meeting is at like 6.30 in the morning. Um, and so I have to make sure I get up and actually speak a little out loud just to myself because otherwise it literally sounds like I just got up because I haven't said anything yet. My voice isn't warmed up. So little things like that that you don't realize until you're in the moment um i think are good tips if you do have the luxury of you know more space that you can play with um i think making that space feel really kind of warm and welcoming to you is also a good psychology tip you can't really see it but i have like a green plant and some fresh flowers and i'm facing the window and i tried having my desk in a different spot but just found that like being able to look outside when I'm on a call and just kind of watch the neighbors walk by and just get the light on me all day um, has been really helpful just to kind of feel better in my space. So those are kind of small tips. I um, actually, so in terms of like setting up your space, so um, I like just have this thing where I like refuse to like actually buy nice stuff for my space. And yeah, I like, wanted a standing desk so i'm actually using a bin that i bought to store my stuff at McAllister the first year after i graduated so like it's very and like i like i got an, another monitor cuz that like really helped but i got it like from my coworker who had an extra one like i have very much like not wanted to spend money on stuff but have found a way to like 
still be able to do things that are more like ergonomic, like standing really personally helps me both with my back and also just like with my concentration, like the first two weeks I was sitting all day. And also I just felt like extremely depressed because there was a global pandemic. Uh, and I found that like standing just like helped you know, wake me up a little bit and like make me concentrate a little bit more. Um, so it's definitely possible to like sort of like um, uh, improvise a setup with like whatever you have. The, the one thing I'll just caution people on, if you do decide to stand and work from a standing desk, make sure you use a pad where, that you stand on, okay? Because that you your back is gonna kill you. And I know this is like a little piddly things, but, but that actually makes a big difference. So, you know, if you, if you spend some time researching ergonomics, you should do like for your home office, just do it and just figure out what's gonna work for you. And if standing is one of those things, you know, like you don't have to get the fancy one as Sophie just mentioned, but you can't, you do need to get that pad. And they, and they come, you can get them for like 15 bucks on Amazon. They stink when they, when you get them, you have to leave them outside and let them air out and stuff like that, but they really do pay, pay dividends. One thing I learned about desks, um, just speaking of ergonomics, most desks are actually like a standard height and I am shorter. And so if I'm going to sit in an ergonomic position, um, I can't really use a standard desk. Um, so your ergonomic, you know, the best position is for everything to be at 90 degree angles. So if you sit on your chair, put your feet on the floor, your legs should be at a 90 degree angle. And then when you put your arms like in front of you to do the keyboard, that should be a 90 degree angle from like your shoulder to your wrist. And so if you just do that without the desk and find out where you are, you might find that actually using a storage box is a better ergonomic position for you than a standard desk or your kitchen table. So something to keep in mind um, for those of you who are not to the standard size like I am. Yeah, I'll underscore all that's been said. Um, I'm looking out at the, I'm in the Seattle area and I'm looking out at our thimbleberries and new maple tree that's blooming. And that just, as you've already heard from other folks, kind of brings the energy back inside. My cat likes it here by the window too. <clears throat> and it's interesting, right? I think there's a little bit of difference, as I'm sure we'll talk about, between working at home normally, uh, per perhaps, and working at home during these times. Um, and I, I think I've gotten to know a lot of my colleagues' pets and kids and <laughs> you know, um, daily life in a way that it's almost the kind of things you don't ask about in interviews that suddenly are filleted open for people to uh, to observe. So I think that it's kind of a new layer of transparency, should I say, um, where you choose to work uh, in your in your home or apartment, um, you know, wherever you might be, porch, park, you know. Um, and I think ultimately finding that center, you know, it, having your presence, you you might often hear it called you know, your brand, but it's really establishing who you are on the screen. I think the comfort, uh, the sense of you know, the comfort that comes from establishing a comfortable place with the ergonomics becomes a big part of what comes across when, when you speak, when you convey your ideas, when you participate in meetings, um, so that it does reflect itself uh, in that way, I think, ultimately. So it is super important. It seems small, like, yeah, like I'm working on a card table again right now. It's a historic card table, mind you, but it's a card table nonetheless. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, the, the screen is just what you see here, right? You don't uh, understand the card table or the storage bins. And I kind of like that part of it, frankly, hearing about it. Anyway, that's, that's fine for me. Go ahead with the questions. Oh, there's the phone, too. All right, thank you all for your answers to that one. Um, I'm gonna open it up to students to see if anyone out there has anything that they wanna ask. Oh, I see Colleen is raising her hand. So if you wanna, if you wanna unmute and jump in, Colleen. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Colleen and I'm a rising senior and this summer I'll be going to St. Paul, Minnesota and doing probably remote the whole time, maybe not, we'll see, um, work with a place called Esther Homes, which is a transitional housing 
place for people who are experiencing homelessness, particularly mothers that have newborns. And um, I was just wondering what your tips are for communication with supervisors or colleagues and how to know, like to balance it, because I don't want to bug people, but also I want to make sure that I know what's going on. So yeah. I can take that one. My first tip would be to ask how they prefer to communicate, what's the best way to communicate with you, and kind of make your communication needs um, transparent to them so that they can, you know, think about how that will best fit into their schedule. I, my philosophy with um, kind of management and leadership, both being, having been a manager and a leader, but also having managers and leaders above me is that I think that the manager and leader, it's, it's um, incumbent upon them to adapt to you. That's what a good manager or leader will do to your communication style. Um, but it is also incumbent upon you to try to understand what their preferences are and then you can kind of meet in the middle. So I would just say, just, just ask, you know, I'm, I'm new to this job. I've never done this before. I think I might have a lot of questions. What's the best way to get in touch with you? I think that that's really good advice. I think the other thing is you really need to listen. Um, it's, it's hard. Um, it's a hard one to kind of really explain, but um, especially when you're working remotely, listening skills are just so darn important. And you will find that if, um, you, if you're really putting those antennae out and being very, very sensitive to, um, to tone and, um, and style and word choice and whatnot, you're going to pick up on, on things that, that, are, um, that, are, that are not necessarily as obvious, right? You can't always take things at face value. You can't take a word at face value. And it's like, we know this from email communications, right? People can misunderstand an email very, very easily. But that's also the same case on the phone and even in Zoom, right? So um, really listening and trying to get to know them as a person and, and how they communicate will help you understand how they want to be communicated with as well, right? Um, and, and so sometimes what, and then the second, so with that, I test things, you know, so as you're getting to know them and, and working with them, you know, you think that you're, you're identifying a personal, a preference or a style of communication that works well with them, test different things and validate whether or not that works. And, and, and you'll, you'll find that like, Sometimes you're going to get it way wrong. And, and that's the last bit of um, advice I'd say on this one is that be patient with yourself. You know, this is really hard to communicate like this. It's not, um, it's not natural for people to spend all their days in front of a screen and, and talking to people via video chat. Um, and so while we might um, feel like they're, we're getting used to it and, you know, becoming experts, it's not normal for human beings to do this. And so you, you have to be patient with yourself and know that sometimes you're going to get it wrong. And that's okay. I think one of the hardest things too um, is the sense of timing, right? That we've all grown up with, <clears throat> with our lag now, um, just a little bit. You can't, humor is more challenging, I think, or those little fun comments like that part of the conversation that sometimes energizes it or, um, you know, uh, shows your personality a bit or something. The, some of the subtleties, the, like you just said, the maybe inflection of, of sentence or words may not come off as clearly. And of course, it, of course, if you freeze with a crazy expression on your face, that's a whole different thing to recover from. You know, <laughs> it's like, when do you do that in a, live, a regular face-to-face -face meeting, right? Um, we might start, I don't know. But uh, it, uh, there's a whole myriad of things like that that uh, we do. And I think, um, yeah, in addition to the, the great advice about just setting expectations, really being deliberate about talking about how do you prefer to communicate um, and being very upfront. We just did a, a team exercise with my team, you know, on working styles. You know, we've done this before, call it last year, but we did it again because I think it, uh, they're new, new revelations, should I say, when we work online. So revisiting some of the things we thought we knew uh, is sometimes also helpful. Um, but I think, yeah, meeting and collaborating, meeting in the middle of that spirit is, needs to be alive and well, you know, listening. Yeah. 
That's good. I noticed that Nita asked a follow-up question about establishing relationships going beyond what Colleen was asking about with, uh, you know, working with supervisors, but also colleagues. And, and um, I'll just say briefly, you know, like the, the, you have to actually want to get to know people and, and, and spend time with them. And so, um, and really genuinely want to understand who they are and where they come from. And so just going out there and starting to say, okay, I want to meet you and I meet you and I meet you like orientation at the beginning of college and just like meeting a ton of people as fast as you can. Not a good idea. <laughs> Not a good idea at all. Like just be deliberate about your communications and, and make sure that if there's somebody that you're going to be working with a lot or somebody that you think that you're going to need to be relying upon for your role, uh, make sure that you're reaching out with them to them and getting to know them. And one of the best things that I'm seeing right now uh, under current conditions is that, and this is something that I was just doing before even um, COVID was happening, is um, at the start of every call, don't get straight to business. Um, you know, many of many of us Americans, we just go straight to straight to the uh, to the start. You know, it's like, okay, let's get let's get started, let's get working, right? And and you need to spend you need to basically budget about the first five, even ten minutes of a call to just catching up and getting to know each other and and really actually um, wanting to know about each other. Um, and if you do that, it really actually pays massive div dividends. People do want to talk about what's going on in their lives. They do want to have that personal connection. And if you spend the time, it really, it, it, it carries on into your relationships as you're doing the work. Um, people will be more patient with you if you make a mistake or if you have a lot of questions. People will actively think of you when they have something that they're working on and they want to pull you into. So um, just those, that relationship development aspect I think is extremely important. You know, here, here. That's a, it's a, it's, it's a great opportunity to lead with vulnerability, if you will. Like, you know, you, you are all in this together. You hear that a lot now, but it's true. Doggone it. Um, and really, you know, we're putting our stuff on our computers on boxes and and card tables, as we said to get started here. We all know that some things are different for many people, especially in this situation. And well, for instance, we start off each meeting with exactly that time. I'm glad you brought it up. Like we, we don't say, well, what do the numbers look like or something, you know, directly into the business part. We say, uh, it's an, uh, you know, it's an optional sharing, but a nice idea that really does break the ice each time, if you will, opens up the conversation. It's like, what are you grateful for? Where did you fail? And when did you say no? And you know, especially as a management team, right? That, some of those things are not usually what you, uh, some people are programmed, should I say, or, or their demeanor is not necessarily practiced that over the years. Um, and it, it really goes a long way. I think we become actually a closer group while working online for those reasons um, in that practice. So it is, we're still people. And I think that's a, that was a great point. Just really take that time, make that time to have the personal connection yeah, I am personally like a really big fan of just like informational interviews in general. Like I love like when I would be in the office, like I and I started, I'd be like, hey, do you want to just like get coffee for like half an hour and like tell me a little bit about your business and when you started and things like that. And I think people like respond really well to that because if you sort of like what Ben was saying, like if you seem like you're genuinely interested, like, yeah, people like are down to talk about themselves if you are like asking good questions and like are excited about what they're saying. And so I think like it's totally fair to be doing that even if you're remote, like just being like, hey, would you be up for like a short phone call? Like if, if this isn't a good time for you, that's totally fine. But like, I would really love to hear more about like, you know, how you started this job or something like that. And people are often really receptive to that and really appreciate it. I think just to take that further, um, one thing you could do is like a virtual coffee date. And that I like because it sets a really clear expectation that we're not going to talk about numbers. We're not going to talk about business. It's 15 minutes. We're going to have a cup of coffee together and talk about our lives or whatever the specific question is. Um, I don't know. I guess I think setting expectations is really important based on this conversation, but um, sometimes you do need to get right down to business and that, you know, the other thing I think is don't take that personally, right? Um, you know, like it just kind of depends on the day. And, and then the last thing I would say is, and I think Ben said this earlier, this is not natural to humanity, 
right? It's pretty good. Like we can accomplish a lot with virtual um, healthcare, with video visits, with like social games online, but it's not natural. And so just having expectations <laughs> that this is different than regular in-person interactions, I think can help get you in the frame of mind that yes, I am still building a connection even though we've never met in person. I'll take it even another step farther and to say, let's add a donut in there too. Oh yeah. <laughs> I like that addition. Yeah, definitely donut if you like donuts. <laughs> All right, Diana, I see you have your hand raised. Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Diana. I go by she, her, hers. I'm a rising senior and this summer I'm going to be, I'm sorry. I forgot. I haven't spoken English. I'm currently in Mexico City, which is home for me, and I'm going to be working this summer as a researcher at the Brookings Institution. And like, my question is, how do you, like, this is, like, I'm very excited about my job, but even right now I have another job, and it's very hard to keep myself motivated and kind of keep that balance between home life and work life, because usually I'll be either at my calendar or at the office from nine to five, and I wouldn't have to do the dishes or like, walk the dog and I think there's that temptation that whenever I have a deadline suddenly the house is cleaner than ever or my mom is like Diana you should be doing this so I was wondering how do you balance that and yeah how do you keep motiv yourself motivated how do you wake up early that's what I've been struggling with mostly right now so I will, any advice would be appreciated. That's an excellent question like and it's a hard one too because i think it's such a personal one right um i can tell you that um you know we what's difficult in this moment is that you know and with the current economic conditions is that um it is definitely not an employee's market right and so it's harder for us to be able to like like just uh, four months ago if you were looking for a job, it'd be very, very, you know, it'd be your market. You'd be able to pick and choose jobs. And, and in general, if like, if you're not motivated by the work that you're doing, um, you know, then you can say, you know what, I don't like this job. I'm going to find another job. Right. And not only that, but um, there's definitely less expectations nowadays in society that you stay at a job for 20 to 30 years. You know, it's, it's more, um, expected that you should be, you know, especially early in your career, moving around and every two to three years finding a new role and, go, and, and growing your responsibilities and getting new experience. Um, I think that motivation, you know, so how do you motivate yourself? Like that's, that's, a, that's where it kind of gets to, to the more personal end of the spectrum. I can tell you what, I, what, I, what, what it motivates me. And, and there's, there's two big things that motivate me. The first is the people I get to work with. You know, clearly, I think that, you know, we're 30 minutes into this call and you can probably tell I'm a pretty social person and I, and I really like to, to spend time with people, right? So, you know, the people that I work with really motivate me. If I'm really enjoying my team and, and, and really having a good connection with them, I feel more motivated because I feel that they're relying on me and I rely upon them, right? And so, um, like, and I get, I get up earlier. I actually get up, get up earlier. Since I'm on the West Coast, I start my days at five in the morning, right? that's a hard time to wake up for many people, right? And so I'm very motivated to, did I get frozen? Are y'all there? We can hear you. Okay, great. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I, I just, that's what motivates me to get up is that. And then two is the work. If I like the work, it, 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 that's what motivates me. And, I, and that's what gets me up in the morning. Um, I think there's answers to this question that um, I could tell you, but I will also admit that it's hard. I think to, like, I wish I could get up every day at the same time and start work at the same time and have some consistency, but it's just not like that. Um, and I just, like, that's okay. The work gets done and that's what's important. Um, but the typical tips are things like have a routine, get up, have breakfast, go for a walk journal, whatever you want to do in the morning to kind of get yourself going, try to do it at the same time every day, you know, get up and take breaks and walk around every once in a while. Um, but I, I thought maybe you're asking a little bit about balancing like work and home chores, which I think is another really interesting thing with working from home. 
Um, and, you know, I think it depends on the, the day and how busy you are. But what I would suggest is trying to try a few different task management strategies where you set a few goals for yourself every day. So one, one that I like is, um, so like I have a to-do list. I do it on paper, but I've tried all kinds of different things with OneNote and Google Docs and Google Keep, and, but I'm kind of back to a notebook for right now. Um, but every day I come in and I say, okay, what are the top three things I must get done today, right? And then I start with the thing that I least want to do and get it done. Now, that doesn't happen every day because sometimes I have a meeting first thing in the morning, right? But I try to do that exercise every day so that then I can feel more free to, like, go for a run or put in a load of laundry um, because I have oriented my day around my to-do list. I love that idea of like doing the thing that you least want to do first. Cause something that I have done before, I don't do this consistently, but um, something that I have done before is like um, trying to write down, like I've noticed a pattern of like when I'll reach for my phone or when I'll walk away to go get a snack or whatever. And I, for like a week at some point, I just wrote down every time I want to do that and what I was doing when that happened. And the thing that I noticed the most was when I was about to do something that I really didn't want to do, like, or, you know, I was about to write, this is when I was doing grant writing. And so it's like, I would finish a paragraph and I'd feel really good about it. And then I'd have to start another paragraph that had a bunch of numbers that I didn't know. I knew I was going to go have to ask someone. And then I was like, okay, I'm just going to look at my, like, because that felt like a, it's a small barrier, but like, it just felt like an extra step. And that's when I would reach for my phone or like look for something else to do. And so like actually keeping track of like the times that you get distracted could actually like be helpful for you in understanding like why you're getting distracted in the first place. Like, why are you going to clean your house at that point? Um, and then also to Anna's point, like, yeah, like it, like it is okay to like not be at a hundred percent productivity right now like it is really scary right now like a lot of us have family members who are older or who are compromised or we are compromised like I think that there is like I, I think it's fair for like your manager to obviously like want you to do your job um but like hopefully whoever you're working with will also understand to some degree if you're not like 100% productive all the time because like you're worried about other stuff. And so I think like recognizing when it like actually is okay to like take a break or like take a breather is also important. I felt really good about cleaning my stove this week though. It, um, you know, there's a certain, I got a degreaser that really worked well and it was amazingly, um, <laughs> I mean, it was a, the gold star of my week. Why? Silver star, right? Is the, why? Because it was, I could point my finger at the thing and say, I did that. I completed it. And so often in work, the, you know, tasks and projects do take much longer than a day or a few hours. And I think there's something actually gratifying and an accomplishment that can be checked off your list. Um, and it's also just a balance. Um, <clears throat> like we've all been saying, um, as well and i think that maybe having you know i mentioned earlier when i was introducing um myself you know having like thinking back to the time when i was writing a book you know that's pretty much you know what do you imagine if you haven't done that what do you imagine that might be well is it writing 24 7 no it's not that um is it a routine yes it's working at home yes for me it was um, there were hours, there were times of day when I was very much on and productive and times when I felt like I should be, should still be productive that I was trying to sit there and I just wasn't. And I think kind of sensing that feeling of when you're really on and when you're less so, maybe your creative time versus the time to take on more rote tasks is a good one to feel out as you, you know, as part of your potential um, mapping, mapping your day. And I found, again, when I, I found that right degreaser and worked on the stove, you know, I was already, it was a break from work, right? But 
uh, just like I've done before, I go sometimes I go swimming if I can during the noon time, or uh, I go for a, a I bike to and from work sometimes, bicycle that is. You know that time I'm not always thinking exactly about the project I'm working on, but I'll tell you I come back the next day or maybe in a bit from the evening or first thing next morning, and I have a new take on it. I've moved ahead, and so that time is important. So nothing is lost, even if your place does look immaculate, <laughs> and and you and you did that. Um, super, it, it's just uh, all part of the picture. And I think briefly too, um, you know, in this situation, certainly when we have everyone working at home, my primary message to everyone is wellness first, and let's let's uh, keep the business running. Um, but helping people adjust uh, to the varied situations, and it is varied. Uh, people who are in San Francisco and studio apartment by themselves, they're stuck there, they've been there for two months. Uh, people who have elderly parents with them and their kids and a spouse who are all working in about three rooms, you know, and the, you know, people who are trapped overseas, you know, for a while, I mean, you name it. And um, my check-ins with them, uh, as their manager is really, how are you doing? You know, it's that mostly that personal conversation. A nice portal into that has been, are you red, yellow, or green? Or s cycling through those like a stoplight does? I mean, what, and that kind of, to the degree they're open to sharing, takes it beyond just how the work is going. Because right now, what can be going on outside of work in life is always bigger than the job does directly and more directly affects the work. So I really make it, uh, try to be very empathetic in, in, uh, in that way and during these times especially. And I think they get it. Um, and I've, in terms of scheduling the day, I have one employee who uh, is great, very creative person. And when he moved to home, he had to literally, I, we kind of worked this out and he's done it. It's helped him map out every five minutes he does the first week he just didn't know what to do he picked up his phone as you were saying would go you know start making these mosaics out of beads that he could find anything but stay on task so and you know it's kind of inventive i thought maybe afterwards he'd have a book about that to write her story but uh other people just naturally flow into it other people are you know juggling wildly different tasks so i think it's varied but uh, you learn something about yourself, for sure. I think we all do, me included, so. Great, thank you all. Um, I think another little thing that I would jump in with as an answer to that question, um, because I was current, not currently, but I was in this situation where um, there were multiple people working from home, multiple generations under one roof for a while. And I know this plays into family dynamics and it's not always possible, but if you can have a conversation with the people around you and say, hey, I have a really important call at this time, or from this time to this time, I really need to focus in on this project. Um, my husband is right now, I said, do not come upstairs. I have a meeting at 12. Please stay out of the kitchen. Don't make your lunch at that time. Um, so I know that that's not always possible, but that can be really helpful too, just to kind of um, see if people can be respectful around you if if that's a possibility. But yeah, that would be my two cents. Um, Mike, do you have anything that you want to ask our panelists? That was really, really, really helpful. Um, I'm since we've been had to go to remote only for all of our internships it uh, I, I just realized that it's it's a huge change for everybody so uh, we've been trying to develop uh, some kind of guidelines for employers who have not managed this kind of thing before or managed interns in from a remote standpoint just to help them think about a lot of the things you you folks are talking about so this is but the this is great from the student perspective too because this is I think people are just truly underestimate how difficult working, you know, significant number of hours are in a remote job. I think that you can adapt, but it, it takes a lot of work and it sounds like, you know, you have some really good strategies for it. So um, I'm wondering how if you, um, how you manage difficult situations or conflict or where you're feeling neglected or not and, and your boss is maybe not 
giving you that uh, insightful attention that you kind of said is great. How can you get your needs met if you're struggling or feeling kind of bereft? I can say something about that. I, um, there's a couple people who are in my program where we do this training for two years. And um, at the beginning of this, I asked if we could set up like a weekly peer call where our managers are not on it and we just get to like share resources and things. And that's been really helpful because then we can sort of come up with like, I'm confused about something or like, did our manager tell you that like, not in a way where it's like a place to complain, but more just like a place to share resources and ideas. Um, so that like, if there is confusion or like somebody does need help from a manager, like people can feel affirmed or they can get their answers from Oh, Sophie, I think you might have frozen. We'll come back to you. We're not just checking in when every when something's wrong. Um, and so especially now, I think making sure that you're doing like regular just check-ins with your peers or your manager or someone so that you can bring things up is helpful. Um, I think the the other thing to ask yourself in that situation is if you can identify what is it that I really am looking for? Is it to resolve this conflict? Is it to be heard? Is it to get more information because I didn't understand what happened there? That might help lead you to a next step. Um, something that somebody told me once that I really liked and that has resonated is to um, kind of build your mental board of directors. Um, so not necessarily like for your business, but rather like who are the people who give you advice and support you? Um, and like that should look different. It doesn't have to be just your boss. So if it is something like I just want to be heard, I just want to talk about what happened and maybe try to understand or just want to vent, you know, that's fine too, right? That doesn't have to be specifically your boss. Just at this point, it could be a peer, it could be your parents, it could be a friend, it could be Tony or Mike, right? It could be different people in your life who are part of this, quote, mental board of directors. Um, and that'll change throughout your career and your, your life. It could be a professor, right? Um, or another graduate who you're friends with in your major. Um, so just, I think, identifying what is it that you're trying to do with the conflict resolution and then so trying to select kind of the best person to help you with that. And it might be like more than one step. And I think too, if you're sensing a, you know, that's great. Um, I like that metaphor quite a bit. That's nice. um, to, to not let it linger or faster, right? If there's something that's really bothering you, especially when we're more remote like this, remote, if you end up working remotely permanently, like that's the kind of job that you, you take or an internship. If there's a question that just lingering and that, take it on, find out, find one of those boards, a board of directors to, to ask, um, and address it. Or if it's feedback, you need to give someone uh, behavior that someone's exhibiting just affects you and impacts you. Make sure to address that. What's the situation? Um, you know, the behavior that's happening, what's the impact on you or other people? You know, get, get to that quickly. And I think maybe that, I haven't really seen get worse, let's say, with, with those kinds of issues. But I think that we need maybe an extra nudge or encouragement to keep keep that kind of dialogue going uh, <clears throat> among ourselves since we're remote. Again, in, in my business so far, thankfully, I haven't seen kind of the tendency, of, so I'll say, for people to hide away uh, as they work remotely. I think that may not be as prevalent in our culture, but I think the workplace culture is something that may, may, I think it always needs to be nurtured. Uh, certainly in Salesforce, we really pay a lot of attention to that. And um, that helps make the transition to this fairly uh, easier than it might be. So some of the, those, I'll say softer skills, if you will, um, really are paramount now. The, the last thing I'd add on this one is if there is some form of conflict that you're experiencing, 
um, if there's somebody that you're not getting along with or you feel like that you're greedy against or that um, you feel might be undermining you or if you feel like your boss is not necessarily being supportive of you and whatnot, um, you know, be very, very careful about, um, you know, staying present and not rushing to action, okay? Like in many cases that discomfort can feel really, really um, bad and you, you, wanna, you wanna take care of that discomfort as fast as you can. And that's not the right approach. In many cases, as um, Anna was identifying, like if there's those people out there that you can get it as a sounding board and to help you <clears throat> go through that process of thinking through the problem and getting comfortable with it and, have, and taking that time and space to be able to have a constructive conversation. And to Byron's point, when, you, when you're ready, have the conversation, absolutely. You should not let it fester. You should not let your, to, to, to let those things, that, that resentment or anything else build up over time. Because little slights can grow to bigger things over time. But um, rushing to resolve it too quickly can also be really problematic. And so you need to spend the time knowing yourself and knowing how you need to navigate that relationship and how to, how to you can make it the best possible thing. And, it, and the thing is emphasis on best possible thing because there's going to be a situation where it's just, you're not going to be best friends or, you know, that boss is never going to be that inspiring boss that you were hoping for. And that's okay. They don't have to be right. Um, you just have to be able to find a way that, it's a productive relationship that you feel that you're getting the experience that you want. You're being challenged in the ways that you want um, and that you can, that you can take something away from this rather than feeling that it's exactly like a movie where you're best friends with your boss, you know, and you go out to drinks after work and stuff like that. Just, you know, sometimes it's, that's not possible and you have to be okay with it, but you do need to make sure that you take the time to think about how to best address the situation. I think at this point in your careers, um, you will also learn to, or you'll learn what you value in those relationships. So you may find that this is the type of boss I really get along with and this one, not so sure, but each of those experiences is really valuable, right? As you're getting your first kind of um, nine to five-ish jobs out of school. Um, this is the type of team building that I really respond to and this feels too personal or, um, like this type of leadership and management is something that really inspires me, um, but more like task oriented, it doesn't resonate with me. You know, like those experiences and lessons will, and the sooner you can learn them, basically, the sooner you have those difficult opportunities, the faster you'll be prepared to really advocate for yourself when you are in a position to choose, um, which will be sooner than, than you think. Um, and then the other thing I would say is like, this is, if you're starting an internship, this is totally unprecedented. Most companies would never start a remote intern. So this is going to be hard for everybody. Um, and I think I would just come back to trying to set really clear expectations with your, you know, future boss around, I don't really know what being an intern in a remote environment looks like. Like, what does that look like to you? This is kind of how I think I like to work, but that's one of the things I'm trying to learn. Like, I think just being honest about where you are. I was talking to another McAllister student earlier this week. When you're interviewing, and I think part of like the first few days on the job, you're still kind of interviewing, right? You're getting your footing, you're trying to prove yourself. The thing that I find that I can see through right away is a lack of authenticity. Um, I'd rather you tell me, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. Then try it and do it the wrong way or try it and it doesn't make any sense. Um, so I just think, you know, this is a very difficult thing that you guys are doing and you have a great support structure with McAllister and this alumni community and, and such. Um, but your bosses won't, they've never done this before either, most likely. And I just think, it's okay to ask. Yeah, there's um, maybe you know this concept already, but there's an assumption, I think. Uh, as, even as you move from year to year in college, certainly when you graduate and, and get that first job or go to grad school, you know, you're stepping up. That's a stair step. And I should just, I graduate, I'm stepping here. It's just a direct step up. Well, guess what? That's not the case, usually. <laughs> and to your point, there's a concept um, that I, it's rung true for me every time. Uh, it was true 
when I moved from Microsoft to Salesforce two or three years ago, right? So later in the career, it still happens, even though I know what I'm doing, right? <clears throat> it's called the pit of success. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> and the pit of success is, it happens to everyone to be, that's the research shows that, that when you go and undergo a change, right? It's not just a, a step up or a step across even, but you drop, right? You drop into, a, a, it feels unfamiliar, like you've been saying, like, uh, and it's for everybody. That's the common ground you have when you're beginning, that, you, that people do go through this. And your new colleagues, your new boss has also gone through this, whether or not they admit it. But there's a, like a pit that you kind of slide into and then you have to, you slowly you claw your way out by getting to know people, by suddenly learning what all the acronyms mean and, you know, in the new workplace. And, uh, uh, you know, after a period of time, you're, you do ascend to that next level, that higher step that you, you know, had aspired to. But there is a, that it's an adjustment period, but it's very natural. Um, and I think just understanding that that's an expectation has helped me, has helped many people, especially people uh, stepping into the job for the first time. I think that the one thing I want to stress for all of you who are stepping into internships, as somebody who has managed interns before um, and have ha has had successful internships and disastrous internships, um, you know, with, with people coming in, um, the the if you can approach it as there's no job too small that will be a, that will make a big deal in this moment in time you know like it, in general um where i've had very successful interns are the ones that when they start they just try and find a way to make a difference and it could just be like editing a word document you know and, and, and checking for spelling and grammar you know it could be you know um throwing together a shell PowerPoint deck to pre start preparing for a meeting. It could be things that just, they're not fun. They're kind of like grinded out kind of tasks, but they really make a difference for the team. And it, st it starts allowing you to contribute right away. Um, you know, like the, the, the interns that did not do well in my experience, at least working with me as an individual or with my team, they're the ones that basically said that I don't want to do that kind of work. I only want to do the, the more substantive, strategic, important work out there. And, and really kind of had a bit of a chip on their shoulder. And um, if, you, if you approach it humbly, and if you just look for ways to be able to make a difference and make people's lives a little bit easier during the day, they'll start giving you more stuff. And the, and the stuff they'll give you is gonna be more substantive because they're starting to get to know you as somebody who is a self-starter that can, that can make a difference and that, you'll, and that they're gonna try things out on you. And as you, get, as you are successful in those things, they'll give you even more interesting things. The hard part is that an internship is temporary, right? And so coming into it, it's essentially they're like, okay, well, there, there's two reasons that people have an intern, you know, in my experience. The first is that they want some, somebody cheap and temporary and just get, get some, getting some st stuff done over the summertime. They'll take advantage of the cheap resource, right? The other is because they have that, in, in, that interest in making sure that people have a really good start in their careers and having that foundation. The majority of people who have interns are the first, just to be perfectly frank, right? Um, if you f find yourself with somebody who's a second who really, really wants to invest in, in people and wants to, and kind of feels like they want to pay it forward, you're lucky and grab that internship and run with it and try and establish that relationship. But if you find yourself in the first, you can still make it into something really special. You can still get something out of it. It just takes that level of humility and being able to just go ahead and get in and make a difference right away. Okay. This is all awesome, awesome advice. Um, so I want to be mindful of time. Um, are there any last questions from students that they want to sneak in here before we have to wrap up? Diana has one more. Go ahead. I'm not. Sorry. I'm oh, sorry that fine. I have another question. What would, I always ask this in my informational interviews, what are some unusual tips that you will have in this case for working remotely? Either some apps or like systems, I think you have shared, even like snacks or ways to continue working that goes beyond the usual advice. I love to take a one song dance break uh, between tasks. 
you just do one song and then you're done. It's very cathartic. Right now it's the new Kim Petra song. Just, it's very good. Okay, I'm gonna go the exact opposite direction. I like the cat nap. I'll be perfectly frank. There are days, there's time in the day where like, especially like about one or two o'clock in the afternoon, you've had lunch, you, you're kind of on the tail end of your day and you're tired. Um, this is the beautiful thing about working from home. Nobody can look in your office, you know? <laughs> so taking a cat nap is a okay and nobody's gonna notice, all right? <laughs> so just do it. And the thing is, Make sure it's just a cat nap, okay? And when I mean a cat nap, I really, really mean like 15 minutes. Like just close your eyes for 15 minutes. If you let it go longer than that, you're going to go to sleep, sleep. And then you're going to have a hard time getting back up and running again. Just really be diligent. And the, and the best way to do that, just to, I know this sounds really, really ridiculous, but, you know, like I just set an alarm on my phone, right? I put the phone across the room for myself. So 15 minutes or set a timer for 15 minutes, phone's way far away from you, put it loud. So it's going to annoy the heck out of you. And then you will get up. And then once you're standing up, you're, you're up and running again, you'll find that you're, you're refreshed. But, um, you know, the, allowing yourself that, that, that luxury, honestly, it's, it's a glorious thing. I will go the other direction again. I, if I went to sleep for 15 minutes, I wouldn't sleep. I, I can't nap basically, even if it's the weekend. Um, but I like to go for a walk. Um, and sometimes you can do that. You can multitask. You can do it on a call. You don't have to be on video. You don't have screen share. When I talked to the other uh, McAllister uh, guy this week, I went on a walk and just told him I was going on a walk. Um, or I'll try to exercise maybe in the noon hour. Um, but doing something active for me, especially because I do computer work primarily um, throughout the day, ideally a few times, which is, is kind of effective for me. Dark chocolate. It's good. <laughs> you, can, you can have too much, that's true, but uh, it can be close at hand, closer at hand than maybe good. You know, I, I, sometimes, you know, when I look at my schedule, and this has been... Uh, true of everyone in, in our my area at work we're busier than we've ever been i mean again we're grateful for that i guess but uh wow it's busier and my calendar looks like a wall of bricks it's half hour little bricks pasted together with not much mortar in between there so it is sometimes a handful of dark chocolate uh, as opposed to those longer workouts i found like i said earlier something physical super helpful and you know to your dance party uh, break we've what we've kind of started is like a name that tune thing. A couple of us to get together for half an hour uh, and just do a name that tune and pick different periods of time, even Baroque stuff, which some, some people do have a fancy for. And it's kind of interesting, right? But something, in other words, wildly different than what you were just doing. Um, I, my cat nap turned into a longer thing the other day. It was kind of, uh, it was good, but not so good. It was fun, but you know, things like that happen. Um, but it's, yeah, breaks, something different, mix it up. To that point, I think it's also really good to think about your work. We tend to get into, as everybody's starting to discover Zoom fatigue and how difficult Zooming is all the time. And if you're on it too much, it, it, it's, it's very wearing. So I think I'd recommend that you try to look at your work day and identify the meetings that could be done just via phone and just say, can we just talk by phone? Because we're all kind of getting into this Zoom kind of reliance and as Anna said if you could have a have a nice meeting that and you're doing it while you're taking a nice walk outside that's fabulous um, and the other thing that I'd recommend is that remember that to show your personality as much as you can via zoom calls too we tend to be just talking heads just looking and and it's good to I, I'm recognizing when I go out shopping everybody's wearing a mask now it's really difficult to see people can't smile at each other and uh, so Smile and be, uh, you know, be energetic in your Zoom calls. I think it brings energy to your your overall meeting. So when you can do that, and I'd say as much as possible, have the video on, <clears throat> you know, keep the mute on. Of course, you've all learned that over the past rest of the semester, but it's it's helpful even in the larger meetings. Um, now that Grid View or this whole you know Hollywood Squares, if you remember the show, View is on. For most people, um, 
especially as you're getting to know people, but it just, again, shows that you're present, um, even if you're not the one speaking or will not be speaking. And so it's a little, it is a little more being on totally it adds to, it's more stressful for that. But I think in important meetings, that could be something to make sure to do. And look at that background you've got there. That's stunning. Where did you just move to? A different room in the home? <laughs> I just, the, my other alma mater, Hogwarts. Ah. <laughs> good. Yeah, we, those backgrounds are on. We have people who are, have, you know, dawn green hair now and, and then. People have fun with it, right? And it's, uh, it, you know, at the right level, right? right. Uh, you know, it's all fun. So we see that even in, you know, big corporate America, uh, et cetera. It's where people ultimately, and all this workspace has to run on the human operating system 1.0. And uh, our experiences, same thing. It's let your personality, I like that comment, let your personality show. That's what you do if you're in person. So, it, you know, make your go at it here as well. It's good. Um, hey, one other little tip, uh, Mike, Mike, to your point about um, Zoom fatigue, your computers might have like a night mode where it removes the blue light. Um, I know I have a PC for work, but I, I'm pretty sure Mac also has it. Um, I have that on all the time. So I'm like never looking at the blue light, which I found actually really helps just feel like I'm not staring at a screen all the time. So you could look at that too. Good tip. All right. I just want to be mindful of everyone's time. Thank you all. Let's give our panelists a virtual round of applause. You can use your little hands or you can actually, your actual hands. Um, I, I appreciate you all taking the time to do this um, and I'll let you all go take your naps now. But students, just a reminder, class of 2020, if there's anyone in the Zoom from class of 2020, make sure you do your senior survey. Um, I'm gonna send a follow-up email with the panelists' contact information. I encourage you, reach out to your alumni network. Um, and it doesn't just have to be an alum, but people who are in your field of interest, um, they want to help, they want to, they want to talk to you, um, especially during this time when, when we know we're all struggling a little bit. So use MacDirect, use LinkedIn, um, take advantage of that, that great network that you all have. Um, and I just want to, again, say thank you all for joining us. And I hope you have a really nice long weekend. I hope you can take advantage of it. Thank you. See you later.